So John, how normal is this? Um, <laughs> We, um, let's, let's start, you've served in so many great positions. You've served at the cabinet level, both as ambassador to the United Nations and director of national intelligence. And deputy secretary of state ends up being practically a cabinet level post because of the range of commitments. Uh, you were deputy national security advisor in the Reagan White House where uh, within a year, the secretary of state was gone, uh, Al Haig. Um, Turnover happens in these jobs. Bill Clinton lost a Secretary of Defense. Um, how, but how normal is this? We've seen White House staff turnover on the national security side. We're on our third uh, national security advisor. We've got a new Secretary of State uh, coming up for confirmation. Help, help us level set on this administration. Well, first of all, thanks. Uh, Bill, and, th and thanks uh, to all of you for coming uh, this evening. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, well, I don't think we know for sure how normal or abnormal uh, this might be because uh, we can't foresee how the remainder of uh, the president's term will, will work out in regards to personnel turnover and that kind of issue. But uh, let's recall that President Reagan had six different national security advisors uh, in his eight uh, year period as President of the United States. So that's quite a lot of turnover no matter how you look at it. Um, it's true that the Secretary of State changed, but early in the administration, General Haig left after uh, a little bit more than a year, year and a half, something like that, and Secretary of State uh, George Shultz filled in behind him for the remainder uh, of his term of office. So he had almost, uh, I think he had a little bit more than six years as Secretary of State. So, so you just can't tell. I think the, uh, it, it's, I would not pronounce it abnormal at this particular point in time. I think we have to wait. This sometimes is a shakedown period, particularly with a new president who has not had a lot of prior uh, government experience. In this case, he had no prior government experience. So uh, getting used to how to do the job and figuring out what he's comfortable with, uh, I think may take a certain amount of time. The one thing I can say for certain is that uh, the president, first of all, he has the authority to organize himself and his office for foreign policy in just about any way that he wishes, and there have been many, many different models over history. Um, and secondly, I think it's very important over time that the three key advisors that he has in the area of national security get along with each other, and that is to say the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, and the uh, National Security Advisor. So those, the relationship between those three, I have found in my observation to be absolutely critical to managing a successful national security and diplomatic uh, policy. So these jobs are grueling, right? Tell us a little bit about what the life of those three people and you know the half dozen other critical jobs around them, UN ambassador, CIA and Director of National Intelligence, which are sort of, uh, and particularly at this moment where there's a lot of turmoil in the world, ongoing conflicts in Syria and across the Middle East, tensions with North Korea. What, what is a day in the life like and, and what should we be looking for to see if this team's coming together? Well, the day in the life, uh, I mean, it, it is grueling. I don't, I'm not sure many people outside of government or even within government, but who are not close, uh, uh, close up, actually appreciate how much uh, time and effort is involved. I, I can give you the example of my own position as Director of National Intelligence, because I mean, that was a pretty tough schedule, but I, was, uh, I would get the draft of the President's daily brief the night before, maybe around 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock, and it would be sent to me by secure means, uh, to my home, and then I'd go into the office, uh, get up at five in the morning, be at the office by six or 6.30, review the briefing with uh, the analysts who were gonna make the presentation to the president, and then, you know, the day started, and it didn't usually end till seven, eight, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock at night, depending on the circumstances. Uh, different, uh, different presidents approach their job in different ways, and, and they rarely burn themselves out <laughs> as fast as their advisors. And in, in, in fact, uh, and, and there was, uh, we don't want our presidents to burn themselves out. 
but uh, Reagan, for example, really, Re President Reagan paced himself. He came into, uh, he was a nine to five guy. He came in at nine o'clock. You could set your clock by when Mr. Uh, Reagan would arrive at the office and you, you knew when it was five o'clock too as you watched him leave back for the, uh, the residence. He would do his homework if you gave him reading to do at night, but he kept very regular hours. George, and so it was a pleasure to brief him. General Powell and I used to go in. Powell was the national security advisor. I was a deputy. We gave him his national security briefing every morning at 9.30, which gave us time without having to come in at an inordinately early hour to uh, prepare to brief him for his uh, on national security matters. President Bush, but he was a George W. was just so full of beans, if you will, and he and he also notoriously went to bed early, about eight or eight thirty at night, because uh, he didn't drink and he he just didn't particularly like <laughs> he didn't like nightlife, he didn't like partying, right? His wife used to complain. You remember? She said, "It's like desperate housewives." Was, uh, uh, so he'd be up and full of energy by about uh, six in the morning, get in the office 6.30 or so. I mean, uh, I, he must have, I mean, Mr. Hadley, the National Security Advisor, had his work cut out for him. So we're, we're in a moment with, uh, where a debate that's actually been pretty persistent in American history about how engaged to be in the world, um, how internationalist should we be, how globalist should we be. We're seeing it in places like Syria, certainly, but even whether to stay in Afghanistan, what our commitment to um, a number of places around the world, uh, North Korea, where we have a, a major troop presence. And the president seems to be of two minds about this. 10 days ago, as we were talking about the event, the president said, I'm getting out of Syria. And then in the last day or two, in response to the chemical weapons strikes, I mean, uh, attacks, he, he seems to be saying that he may be engaged again. You've been in a number of different conflicts from Iraq and Afghanistan recently to back in your early service in Vietnam where the U.S. has had a long-standing commitment. What should determine those kinds of crossroads moments for a president? What is, what is the right way to be engaged and when, when should we get out? Well, I guess first if you look at the sweep of, say, a century, let's say go back to Woodrow Wilson and our involvement in World War I and then go forward. And you can see that some of this happens in waves, right? And there are ups and downs in terms of our, the level of engagement that we undertake internationally. And after World War I, we pulled in our horns uh, for uh, almost 20 years. After Vietnam, I can remember there was, uh, and, and I served in Vietnam, uh, there was a real concern in this country about not repeating Vietnam, never again. And so for uh, the next, 15, maybe 20 years, there was tremendous reluctance to think about sending troops abroad until the first Gulf War. That was really what broke the, uh, what, what interrupted that trend. So what I would say is events are extremely important over which sometimes you have practically no control whatsoever. But if Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait, as he did in 1990, well, you know, as a leader of the free world and with the responsibilities that we have for for upholding and helping to uphold the world order, uh, I think Mr. Bush uh, Sr. felt an obligation to get involved. So, but your question goes to, to what extent is this a discretionary issue and to what extent is it not? And Richard Haas wrote this book with the rather well-known title, War of Necessity and War of Choice, and he compared the two Iraq wars, right? The, the, the first Gulf War and the second. Uh, war uh, in Iraq, and I think the second one was more discretionary, there's no doubt. What, what determines um, whether you're going to engage or not? And I think there's a whole host of, of considerations, but if I were to judge at the moment and, and try to read this president, it seems to me his intuition is to avoid uh, extensive engagement internationally, certainly with our military uh, forces, and maybe even to the extent of, uh, of, of wanting to pull our horns back with respect to being involved in a whole variety of matters around the world. You remember a couple of times he said, you know, I'm, I'm president of the United States, not president of the whole world. So now you've mentioned this really interesting situation where he says we're going to withdraw from, I think you can hold those two contradictory thoughts in your mind at the same time, I really do. Uh, in the instance of 
we got to leave. I think what he's saying is, uh, we don't want to get involved in a, quag a quagmire over there like we created for ourselves in Iraq. And what he's, I think, really thinking about, I haven't been sitting in on the internal councils of our government at the moment, but I think he's thinking about what do I do about the 2,000 American troops that are in Syria now? And, and if, if we keep them there, why are we keeping them there? And then he's suddenly confronted with this issue of the use of chemical uh, weapons by the Syrian government against their own people, these dramatic photographs. You never, never underestimate the impact that photographs can have on decision making in the White House. You have these dramatic pictures of be people being burned and maimed and killed by, by these weapons. And so now he's got to do something about it. And clearly he's got to respond. Uh, I, I, in, in my view, I don't think he has any choice in the matter. The question is going to be, do I respond in some kind of a one-off fashion to show uh, that, you know, to punish the Syrian government for doing that and say that if you do it again, we'll do it again? Or do I try to get more involved and try to shape some kind of a solution for the Syrian problem, which up until now has completely eluded us and which I think is a bit of a fool's errand? Yeah, he, he did one of those strikes a year ago. And now he may come back and, and do another one. What, what does this cycle feel like if you're in a White House? Well, I mean, it's a, you know, there's a process. I, I, I don't, some people are somewhat skeptical about how much of a process there is at the moment but uh, within the White House and within the national security system. But there are these key players we're talking about, the State Department, the military and the national security advisor, and the way the process works, of course, is uh, if the president says, "Well, give me some, give me some military options," then the, the Pentagon is going to draw up uh, several different possible choices of sort of low, medium, and high options in terms of intensity, if you will, and and uh, duration, and then the, that idea will be vetted amongst these key players in the National Security Council, and ideally, then they'll make a recommendation. The president will take his decision. But uh, it can be very feverish, depending on how quickly he wants to, to do something. I, I gather, and I'm curious to know how much you followed this, that a similar debate in those councils happened about how deep and how long to stay in Afghanistan. Um, uh, with, with the military in particular, uh, Mattis pushing him to stay and him wanting to get out. Uh, give us a little sense of what, both what you know about that and even if you're not as closely familiar, what, what does that position feel like if you are a cabinet secretary urging a president to do something he right. doesn't want to do? Right. Uh, I, mean, I think the, the, that debate also took place and probably is constantly reviewed with respect to Iraq because we, have, we continue to have a presence in both countries. And it's kind of interesting because President Obama effectively took the decision during his term of office to withdraw our troops entirely from both of those countries. But that never quite uh, came to pass. You remember when he gave the speech about the pivot to Asia? He was in Australia. He was speaking to the Australian Parliament, and he says, "We're going to pivot uh, our, a lot of the focus of our uh, diplomacy and national security to the East Asia Pacific region because that's sort of the demographic uh, and uh, economic epicenter of the world." And, and it's sort of a recognition of the, of the trend of the rise of China, rise of India, and so forth. But and I read it, I read that speech as also saying, look, I want to get out of Afghanistan. I want to change the focus and concentration of uh, our country abroad on Asia rather than the Middle East and South Asia. But it, it turned out, I think, in some senses, just not to be feasible. And we have so many... I hate to use the word, but we have so many sunk costs in those countries that I think a lot of people are reluctant to just throw the entire baby out with the bathwater. And I think what the search is for is some level of commitment by the United States in both of those countries that helps give encouragement to the good guys, if you will, uh, and provides a, mo a minimum or a modicum, really, of uh, military and intelligence support, right? Logistics, intelligence, and so forth. But does it at a sustainable, a politically sustainable 
cost for the United States, but is enough to actually make a difference. It isn't just a drop in the bucket. It's something that is consequential over there. And you'd be surprised how much difference it can make to these forces locally if they know that the United States in some tangible way and visible way uh, has got their back. So you, you mentioned intelligence in that mix, and I before we pass the baton to the next panel, I do want to come to issues of intelligence. You were the director of national intelligence. Big, complicated issues running through the intelligence agencies, all of them, CIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, others that collect and use information. You, you wrestled with some big ones post 9-11 and those Bush administration days and then with the ongoing wars. Um, so give us a sense of some of those issues, but also with the intelligence agencies themselves now being called into question, President Trump calling them the d talking about intelligence failures in Iraq and elsewhere. How do you assess the state of our intelligence community, which is a huge part of the federal budget? It dwarfs the State Department where you served for Alas. much of your career. Um, I just give us a sense of how we should think about yeah. intelligence. Actually, it doesn't dwarf the State Department. It's roughly equivalent in, in the size of the budget, although the state, there seems to be a concerted effort to reduce the State Department budget back in Washington, whereas the intelligence community had, to, had the intelligence or prescience or, or luck to have its budget buried inside the Pentagon budget, which goes up inexorably. So uh, you can... Uh, you can, as a rule of thumb, assume that about 10% of the pen Pentagon budget goes to intelligence expenditures. So that's a lot of money. Um, first, I'd like to sort of say something, the sort of a bottom line question, which is I really do think our intelligence is one heck of a lot better today than it was at the time of 9-11. It's better integrated. Uh, we've got uh, the agencies uh, pretty much uh, working from the same sheet of music. We've got the law enforcement and the intelligence people working much better together than they used to. That was kind of an anathema in the old days, and I, don't, I think FBI, CIA relations are, are pretty good now. Um, and we've really, a technology has been our friend in uh, the conduct of intelligence activities and operations because we can integrate all these different streams of knowledge that we have, whether they come from human intelligence or, or uh, aerial sub, uh, observation or from uh, signals intelligence. We can integrate them in real time so that you can carry out su such amazing operations as the one that ended up killing Abu Musab al-Sarqawi in Iraq uh, with, a, you know, with a couple of shots. Uh, because we were able to locate him and track him and finally uh, uh, bring him down. So, uh, and, and our special operations particularly, and that's true of course with Zarqawi and bin Laden, I think this, the level of proficiency and competence of American special operations is sort of, if, in my opinion, at some sort of a zenith at the moment. And I think that's one of the great accomplishments of our intelligence uh, community. So. The important thing about intelligence, the, the things that have gotten us into trouble in the past and which we always have to guard against is to be sure we really understand what it is we're looking at. Uh, many of the intelligence failures have been in failures of analysis. They've not been failures of collection. Just like the weapons of mass destruction fiasco with respect to Iraq where we ended up believing a source who was making the stuff up and saying that Saddam had, had weapons of mass destruction. So you have to constantly check yourself and build safeguards in throughout the community so that they can always uh, you know, reevaluate what their conclusions are. Uh, you know, pick, take any set of facts and then maybe give that set of facts to more than one group of people to analyze and see if you come up with different results, that kind of thing. But that, I think, is really important. I think they've done a lot to accomplish that. And, I, and as I said earlier, I think our intelligence community is in better shape than it was 15 years ago. So is there a deep state? Is the intelligence community, <laughs> is, is the intelligence community concerned about or opposed to a president that seems to want to withdraw from the world? If you take in the, the most sophisticated version of the critique against the intelligence community, they're all globalists. They're committed to a global presence 
And we have a president who wants to put America first, and they want to bring him down because he doesn't believe in their global reach. Do you believe that? Uh, I'm asking <laughs> you. I, <laughs> I don't think so. I think he started out uh, with this uh, expressed skepticism about the intelligence community, and he said the so-called intelligence community. You know, but I note, and he said he wasn't going to take the daily brief, but he ended up taking it anyway, and he takes it now with regularity, and he even comments favorably uh, upon it. I think part of it, you know, there is this in, in conservative and uh, circles and those outside of government, you know, outside of what, the Beltway, who think of this uh, bureaucracy that has some kind of a hammerlock on the way the country is run and that you're an ins inescapably a prisoner of that system. The truth of the matter is, these are capable, dedicated people waiting to be led. That's what they want. Uh, seriously. And, um, uh, you know, the more leadership, they want to know what the president wants to do. They're not going to decide whether we stay involved in Afghanistan or Iraq. That is genuinely and truly above their pay grade, and they know it. Well, uh, with respect to what the president wants to do, I think we're going to turn that over to our next panel. But, John, let me thank you for giving us some backdrop, backdrop on... Uh, a very big, complicated world that we live in, and uh, a president who, uh, like many presidents in their first year, is, is learning their way. So as, as we watch his way go forward, we hope to continue to come back to you for guidance and advice. Thank you very much.